Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, coming to you on World Veterinary Day. Before we start Gross Path Challenge number 67, do you know it's been 35 years since I graduated from veterinary school? And it's been a wonderful ride. I've enjoyed every single day of it. And I hope that you have all out there have 35 years and more in this wonderful profession of ours. And every day brings you the fun and wonder that being a veterinarian has brought. With that, Let's begin. Slide number one is from a box turtle. Can you give me a pathogenesis for this lesion? Okay, time's up. There's two ways you could have gone on this and both would have been excellent. Uh, the first one can happen to any turtle that's kept in bad conditions. And what we're looking at is an abscess of the ear or an oral, A-U-R-A-L, abscess. These generally arise in turtles from bacteria, gram-negative bacteria that live in the oral cavity and ascend to the ear through the eustachian tube. Now the term oral abscess is actually a misnomer because reptiles have heterophils instead of neutrophils. Okay, heterophils lack myeloperoxidase, which is the component that liquefies pus. So you'll never really see a reptile with the ooey gooey abscess, they get a lot of granulomas or heterophilic granulomas when there are a lot of heterophils in them. So the morphologic diagnosis would be uh, heterophilic and granulomatous otitis media, and uh, the cause would be a gram negative organism. So that's one possibility. Second possibility is an absolutely classic lesion of turtles, uh, especially pet turtles when they used to sell them in pet stores. Uh, many years ago, even before I became a veterinarian. And what happens is they would send these animals home with turtle food. Turtle food was essentially ground up ants. And it had absolutely no vitamin A in it. And when turtles have a deficiency of vitamin A or most other species, a glandular epithelium will undergo a, a change to squamous epithelium, which is known as squamous metaplasia from the lack of vitamin A, and it will begin to produce keratin. And as we've talked about before, the body hates keratin. We keep all of our keratin on the outside, our fingernails and our hair. And when you have keratin on the inside of your body, it stimulates a profound suppurative, or in the case of turtles, a heterophilic and granulomatous response. So once again, we have a heterophilic and granulomatous uh, otitis media. Okay. So, taking a close look. Now, as I said, it could also be bacterial infection, and a lot of times you'll see the two uh, at the same time. There's a wonderful case in the Wednesday Slide Conference this year, in Conference 14, uh, case one, I believe, which was a great case of vitamin uh, A-derived squamous metaplasia. Now, one of the differences between these two diseases in the turtle is that when you have squamous metaplasia, it tends to affect a number of other parts of the body, including the lacrimal glands of the eyes. You can also see it in the kidneys. You can see some changes in the lungs, um, but the eyes often become swollen and puffy and the lids may be closed. I'm not seeing that here. So I'm gonna go probably over toward the bacterial infection stimulating this. But uh, if you get a chance, go back to this year's Wednesday Slide Conference, read all the, up about this uh, really interesting condition. Okay, let's move on. Slide number two is tissue from a cat. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and name the condition? Okay, time's up, and this was a condition you know that if you've been in practice, you've probably seen a number of times. Uh, you can see it in middle-aged and older cats, um, and they come in with these very swollen uh, chins. And when you shave it up like this, you'll see that these hair follicles are greatly dilated. They're very inflamed. The morphologic diagnosis would be multifocal to coalescing, a pyogranulomatous folliculitis, and furunculosis. And if you want to throw comedone uh, in there too at the end, that's fine. That's usually an early change. You have comedone formation, keratin plugging, 
plugging of the sebaceous gland, ostea, and then uh, they rupture. You get a tremendous pyogranulomatous response to the extrusion of keratin in the dermis. They often will have a secondary bacterial infection as well. These cats come in with these puffy chins, and it has nothing to do um, with uh, human acne, very different, um, but it is somewhat similar to a disease that's seen in a number of short-haired dogs, um, German wire-haired or short-haired pointers, uh, Weimaraners, English bulldogs, who will also get a big rash, a separate folliculitis, comedone formation, keratin plugging on their chin. Now, the difference between the cat and the dog is it's usually uh, a younger animal, three to 12 months in the dog, and uh, it's thought to arise from animals that rub their, uh, their chin a lot um, and cause folliculitis and furunculosis. The cause in cats, not, uh, uh, not really ever been elucidated totally, um, but they look alike, um, just an age difference, and it has nothing to do with, uh, uh, with human acne. Slide number three is tissue from a foal. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Okay, time's up. This is a great picture by Paul Stromberg, um, which I've had in my collection for many, many years, and he's been gracious to allow me to use his pictures to teach with. They're absolutely phenomenal, and I do have a predilection for the black background. I think it makes colors really pop in these slides. Um, we're looking at the kidney of a foal. Remember we said it many times before, turn this one over and the right kidney looks like a Valentine's Day heart. So you always know where you are. And this is a foal and I told you it's a foal, so that's very important information. What we're looking at are multifocal, coalescing, variably sized abscesses. They are protruding from the surface of the kidney and uh, uh, this is a classic lesion that's associated with gram-negative sepsis. And if I'm going to think of one that's going to give me this pattern within the first week of this foal's life, it's going to be actinobacillus equula. It loves to go to the, uh, uh, to the kidneys, especially to the glomeruli. And if you catch it early enough, it'll be restricted to glomeruli. A lot of what we're seeing here are glomeruli that are full of pus. First, you'll see the bacterial colonies, then they will fill up with pus. Eventually, it's going to spread, and you're going to see it in, uh, in the vessels of the kidney. You'll see it in the interstitium. Um, but early on, if you catch it just right, you're going to see a beautiful suppurative glomerulitis. I like this as a uh, suppurative embolic nephritis, multifocal suppurative embolic nephritis. Um, embolic is one of those words that means it comes in through the vessels. This animal probably had a umbilicus that was contaminated. Um, and the animal, unfortunately, has become septic. You are going to see little white dit dots, as Dr. Stromberg calls them, um, in multiple organs, not just the kidney. You'll also see them in the liver. You may see them in the spleen. And this animal may develop a separative polyarthritis to make matters worse. Um, Actinobacillus equi my number one. Uh, you could pick just about any gram negative, coliform, salmonella. They're all there in the in the little uh, uh, in the barn where the animal is. There's always poop around, so it could be any gram negative. But until proven otherwise, you see this picture. I really like Actinobacillus equali. It's going to be top of my list. Tissue, or slide number four, is tissue from a sheep. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Also name the condition. Okay, time's up. We talked about pox viruses and parapox viruses before. They're very similar. They can cause very similar lesions. And whenever we see a 
pox viral lesion or parapox viral lesion, you shouldn't have to think about this. This is a proliferative and ulcerative dermatitis. It causes the formation of pox. That's P-O-C-K-S, not P-O-X. That is the name of a disease or a sort of broad category of disease. And what a pox is, is it, it's infection of the epidermis uh, or epithelium and other tissues, but we're talking about the face here, so we're gonna go with epidermis. And when you have viral infection with pox, you infect the stratum spongiosum, the cells first proliferate and they become hypertrophic. And they proliferate because like all smart viruses, uh, as, as our president would say, uh, what they wanna do is they wanna provide themselves with a lot of cells to infect. So one of the things that you see in box lesions is you see tremendous proliferation of the epidermis, more cells to infect, more cells to spread. And then over time, the infected cells will undergo the uh, uh, pathogenic effects of the virus, they will become necrotic. So the center of a big swollen raised lesion will be the necrotic part. And that's what a classic POC looks like. Proliferative edge, necrotic center, okay? So they're always proliferative and ulcerative. So if you see a pox, viral dermatitis in any species, whether it's a chicken or a squirrel or a sheep, you wanna go with proliferative and ulcerative dermatitis. In this particular case, this is really a, a proliferative and ulcerative chylitis and maybe nasal dermatitis, something along those lines, okay? Um, the agent is ovine parapox virus. Not just parapox viruses, there are the parapox viruses that cause the disease, but don't cause this particular disease. So when we talk about agents, we can say the species it affects and the, uh, the family of virus. And then uh, name the disease. I know a lot of you probably said it's ORF because it's a fun name and we learn it, it's simple and it sounds fun to say it, but that's not actually the name of the disease in the sheep. This is contagious eczema. Now I'm glad that a lot of you who I didn't really hear, I'm just sort of making that up, said ORF, and I'm really happy because this person is wearing gloves because this is a zoonotic disease. And ORF is the name of the disease in people. And instead of giving you sort of this crusty lesion, it's gonna give you one of those nice big pox on your hand. It's gonna be necrotic. Supposedly they hurt like the devil. So this is a zoonotic disease. And uh, you can go on the internet and find some really gross pictures of people with ORF. And it's not something that I've ever had the pleasure, nor would I want to have. And I hope none of you get it as well. So be careful around these animals. Slide number five is tissue from a chicken. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Okay, time's up. We are looking at the Sika and one has been opened, one is greatly swollen. We, it is filled with blood and necrotic debris. Morphologic diagnosis that I'm looking for is bilateral necrohemorrhagic teflitis. When I see one that's this bloody, the first thing that's gonna to jump to my list is coccidial infection, especially Imeria tonella. That's the one you wanna remember that affects the Sika. There are 10 or 12 different uh, Coccidians that affect the GI tract of poultry, especially chickens. I generally remember three. Uh, Imeria cervulina, which affects the duodenum and causes white patches. Imeria nicatrix, which affects a lot of the intestine um, and causes, like it says, a lot of necrosis. And then tenella, which likes to go after the Sika. It's not the only thing that causes necrosis in the Sika of chicken and other poultry birds. You can also see Histomonas meleagridis, which will do it. You can also see Salmonella, which will do it. When I see this amount of blood, I usually go with Imeria first. Um, the other ones tend to be a little more pale. You tend to have the chronic cores, but without this amount of blood. So, to me, this one just screams, I marry a Tanella, and I hope you remember it that way.
Slide number six is tissue from a dog. Can you tell me what this structure is? Give me a morphologic diagnosis. That's good too. Okay, time's up. We're looking at the thyroid gland. Here's a nice big external parathyroid that we can see. And the, st the structure I'm interested in is this little cyst here. And this is just a fun thing. It doesn't cause any problems. But these are called Kirsteiner cysts. And you can see them in dogs and cats and probably most other species. And they generally are apparent uh, at the interface between the thyroid and the parathyroid glands. And they're essentially, this is where the uh, uh, primordial third and fourth pharyngeal pouches will fuse. Sometimes they'll fuse, just don't fuse quite right. And you get this little cyst. And it's Kirsteiner's, K-U-R-S-T-E-I-N-E-R, -E -E cyst. And I don't know anything else he ever did, but his name lives on, Dr. Kirsteiner. Slide number seven is tissue from an ox. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and two possible causes? Okay, time's up. Well, we have two sections of gut here. This could be from two different, you know, uh, independent cattle, I don't know, or probably calves. Um, but we see this focal area of necrosis in both. It's sort of linear and it's well defined and the rest of the mucosa looks great. And this is what happens when you have some very uh, devastating infectious diseases that, that affect cattle and they tend to hit Peyer's patches first. Okay, these are the Peyer's patches. The crosis right now is restricted. Now eventually this is going to affect probably the rest of the gut. But they always start with the Peyer's patches. And there are actually three morphologic diagnoses, uh, but for some of you that are just getting into this game, uh, the third one you'll, you've never seen, you probably will never see it. So let's start with the one that should be number one on everyone's list, and that's bovine pestivirus infection or mucosal disease. Okay, um, that's a, it's a very complex pathogenesis, and when you see mucosal disease, it means that that animal was infected way back in utero with a non-cytopathic strain of bovine pestivirus, which during the right window, 75 to 125 days, give or take, um, sort of tells the calf that that is self. And then it sort of, from that day forward, will recognize bovine pestivirus as not a foreign infectious agent, but part of self. And then if those calves usually, in the first or second year of age, um, are infected with a cytopathic strain, which sweeps through the herd. Um, they recognize this self, and that thing just goes to town because they don't mount an immune response. And one of the first things it does is it goes after all the lymphoid tissue of the body. And the pyrus patch is one of the first things. And then mucosal disease, as we know, affects almost every uh, epithelial surface in the body. Um, but the one it really goes after is the GI tract. And you get uh, ulcers, you get necrosis of the mucosa of many different parts of the body. It tends to skip the abomasum. Um, the oral cavity, the esophagus, uh, the four stomachs, the uh, intestine, colon, um, are all heavily affected. And it'll go beyond the classic virus patch necrosis and you'll get necrosis of the mucosa there. So number one on my list is gonna be bovine pestivirus. The name of that disease is bovine viral di diarrhea mucosal disease. Now, um, bovine pestivirus will cause diarrhea on itself in an animal that wasn't pre-sensitized or pre-desensitized to it. Um, so that's enough about bovine pestivirus right now. Uh, the second one that will do this particular lesion is acute salmonellosis, especially the non-host adapted form, which would be salmonella typhimurium. It generally goes after pyrus patches first. Remember, Hot gram negatives love lymphoid tissue. The first thing they do is go after lymphoid tissue in the GI tract, the mesenteric lymph nodes. Eventually, they'll get into the spleen. Um, so it's a classic way that salmonella, hot salmonellas will go after 
the gut. The third one that I mentioned is not really fair is uh, bovine morbillivirus virus or render pest virus, which uh, will cause a very similar lesion starting with the lymphoid tissue, eventually causing uh, necrosis throughout the GI tract uh, and inflammation in the respiratory system. Uh, but that one has been eliminated. I think from a historical perspective, I learned these when I saw virus by necrosis as uh, pestivirus, morbillivirus, and salmonella. Slide number eight is tissue from a foal. Can you name the disease? Okay, time's up. This is a classic lesion, and this is from a foal. We don't see it too much in foals. It's a little more common in cattle. Um, and if this, there are a couple of, uh, of breeds of, of horses that tend to get this. Appaloosas and uh, Peruvian Pasifinos have been reported. And what we're looking at here is you see these two pyramids of primary spongiosa that have not been remodeled, and they extend all the way into the diaphysis. Okay, you can also see that the cortex is extremely thin. And if this animal was to get up on its four legs, it'd probably break one very quickly. And the condition is known as osteopetrosis. Um, osteopetrosis is a genetic defect in mammals um, caused by defect in the gene SLC4A2, um, which uh, affects the osteoclasts. And it prevents acidification of the uh, ruffled border of that osteoclast, which is what remodels the primary spongiosa, okay? It sort of dissolves away the mineralized osteoid. Um, so what happens is this primary spongiosa coming down from the growth plate is never remodeled, okay? And it just continues to grow and grow. And it's because it's not remodeled, the cortex uh, is not laid down, there are no cutting cones. And you see this in the long bones especially, but you see it in all bones of the body. These animals often have significant uh, defects in the bones of the face. The teeth cannot erupt. So they have a lot of problems. Um, it's different. There's also a form of osteopetrosis in birds, but that is a viral infection by a retrovirus. So you want to keep that straight. In birds, it's virally induced. Um, in, uh, in mammals, it's all a genetic mutation of the SLIC4A2 gene. Um, I should uh, clarify that. Uh, that particular genetic mutation has only been definitively identified um, that I know of in the uh, in red angus calves, which is done by done by Dr. Donald Tool uh, out in the Wyoming State Veterinary Laboratory, um, and I do not know that it has been the genetic precise genetic mutation has been identified in any other species of mammal. Of course, in people there are probably ten or twelve different mutations that will cause this, but we just have the one right now in, uh, in mammalian. So osteopetrosis, a classic and a beautiful lesion and a phenomenal picture uh, by once again, Dr. Paul Stromberg. Could be Dr. Steve Weisbrod, they will both work at Ohio State. Steve is the bone guy. When I say the bone guy, he's the bone guy. Um, wrote so many chapters uh, over the years for Chubb and Kennedy and for uh, again, and Zachary both use a black background. A lot of the bone pictures come from Steve and another phenomenal uh, photographer. And here's Finn. This is Finn and he says, happy veterinarian day to you too. Okay, slide number nine is tissue from a ferret. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Okay, time's up. Um, we are looking at the colon of a ferret. And you ask me, how do I know it's colon? And you just got to know it's a colon on this particular condition. Um, so this is a multifocal to coalescing proliferative 
and necrohemorrhagic colitis. Now here's the normal colon, pretty thin, not, not much going on here, and there's an affected section of the colon. And in that morphologic diagnosis, proliferative is the main port. These animals do bleed a lot. They poop very frequently. They vocalize, it's a painful thing. There's always some frank blood in their poop. But uh, the one thing that you wanna focus on are these large glandular proliferations of the mucosa. And the cause of this condition is Lawsonia intracellulare, and we see that in a number of species, including pigs, where you get a similar proliferation of mucosa, but in the small intestine. Same thing in hamsters. The ferret is a little bit of an outlier because it's the only one in which the bacterium affects the colon. Um, it is an intracellular parasite. It lives in the apex of the cell, uh, right by the lumen, but it's an intra cytoplasmic parasite, stains very well with a silver stain, and it essentially causes a rapid proliferation of poorly differentiated uh, enterocytes, or in this case, colonic glandular epithelium. You see this big glandular proliferation. Unlike all the cell, normal cells around it, you don't see any mucus. And then you have these fine bleeding points in between, very difficult, even on histo, to pick up. Um, so this is proliferative colitis, Every other species, it, it affects the intestine, except for ferrets. Okay, slide number 10 is tissue from a sheep. Uh, can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Okay, time's up. Now, if you're taking certification exams, you can pretty much guarantee that somewhere on the, the uh, what used to be called the gross part, but now we call it the image part, you're gonna have a sheep lung. And there are two big diseases that you need to know and you need to sort of sort out in your mind grossly. Um, and one of those is uh, ovine progressive pneumonia, also known as ovine lentivirus interstitial pneumonia, and classically known as Marsh's progressive pneumonia. The other one is a condition uh, called ovine pulmonary carcinomatosis, also known as Jagsikti. Um, and the first, progressive pneumonia, looks like a chronic interstitial pneumonia. The entire lung is large, it's inflated, it doesn't deflate, you may have rib impressions. The second one, ovine pulmonary carcinoma, looks a bit like this. To me, to my eyes, it always sort of looked like uh, lymphoma. Now, we have the tumor here. This is a pulmonary carcinoma. If you look at it under the microscope, it looks like classic pulmonary uh, carcinomas that we see in other species with uh, lining of the alveoli with uh, columnar epithelium. That's not what you expect in the alveoli, um, forming large papillary projections. Um, it is caused by a beta retrovirus. Sheep have tremendous numbers of retroviruses incorporated into their genome, just waiting for the right insult to the genome to start to proliferate. I think sheep are maybe second after mice in terms of how many separate uh, endogenous retroviruses they have. Now this is a great condition. It's called Jagsikti, which is uh, Dutch for driving sickness. And the reason it's called driving sickness is when you would, when you take the sheep on a drive, or you would walk them, you know, from one valley to the next, or maybe to the market. You would always have uh, three or four that were lagging behind that couldn't keep up. And uh, so those are the ones you would identify that might have this condition. And uh, this particular uh, uh, condition, um, surrounding these areas of pulmonary carcinoma, you have tremendous amounts of edema and macrophages and just a tremendous amount of fluid. One of the big problems with photographing this disease is by the time you put the sections of lung down and you go to take the picture, there's a big puddle of fluid underneath them. And so on the drives, you could take these sheep and you would hold them up by the back legs and this fluid would pour out of their nose. And between the fact that they couldn't keep up and they had this fluid came out, these animals would be the ones who would be identified with this disease long before they knew it was 
a retrovirus. Um, it's a great disease um, and uh, absolutely fantastic lesions. But to me, this is the one that looks like a real tumor. And the other one just looks like a big, uh, meaty, thick lung. They're both caused by uh, retrovirus. Lentiviruses is a, a uh, uh, subfamily of the retroviruses. But this one is an endogenous retrovirus, meaning it's always there in the genome, just waiting for the right two-pronged hit for this animal to develop this type of neoplasm. Well, I think that does it for today. I hope to come back and, uh, and see you again tomorrow with uh, Gross Path Challenge number 67. Uh, thank you for spending a little time with me and with Finn. And if you've been watching over here, because a lot of people like to watch the antics, uh, as so often happens, uh, he goes and wakes Meigs up and wants to play. And she wasn't having any part of it. And she's wandered off to a more restful uh, place to repair to. So with that, thanks for spending some time with me. And I'll see you tomorrow.